Does this uh, preclude them from signing Sasaki, you think? Oh, no. No, Sasaki is going to be really a low money deal. It's really going to be right. out of your international budget. You know, that's that's nothing compared to this. So this the, only helps them sign. So, Sasaki. yeah. So they could trade a Gavin Lux after they signed Teoscar or Soto, and they could trade Lux and an Emmett Sheehan and maybe another prospect and bring in Luis Robert Jr. from Chicago if they want to. They can pretty much do whatever they want to. Right. I mean, you need another team, you need the player, you need the agent, you need people to agree. Well, let's face it. I mean, it is a destination. I think we talked on your show the last time about, you know, destination spots. Los Angeles is a destination spot. L.A. Dodgers may be the most, in, in all of North America, may be the number one destination team of any team in the, in the, in the continent. When you think about it, any professional team, they, they have a, a wonderful ballpark. They've got a great organization, great ownership, uh, a history of winning. They pay. You know, for Scott Boris, and I know Blake Snell wanted to get something done as soon as possible because of last season. But, you know, the, for, ha, for to have Scott sign a player before you get to Thanksgiving, um, no, they, they did well. They did. I think it's 36 a year. You know, there's going to be deferrals in it. They've been deferring a lot of contracts. There's going to be deferrals in it. So it'll be less. It'll show up less than 36. But you're going to be paying $36 million a year for Blake Snell. So for to turn that deal down after what he went through last year, that wasn't happening. So it it all makes sense for for Snell uh, and for the Dodgers to do this, and it just puts them in a greater greater part of leg of uh, leverage than any other club. Yeah, and anybody has questions for Ned? Uh, now's your chance to go ahead and fire away. We've been getting a lot of super chats, but we've got Ned in the house now. So, uh, oh, we already read this one. Um, but if you need to, if you want to get a question for Ned, go ahead and ask that. Uh, do it in a super chat because we can't read every other question. So I'm surprised Phillies don't try and go after Soto. Um, yeah, they, they could do it. Their owner, Middleton, he could do it. Well, but yeah, the, the, you know, they can. <laughs> they're really, I mean, they're like the Dodgers in so many ways. They're very well run. Dave Dombrowski's done a great job. Um, Preston Mattingly, Don Mattingly's son, who we drafted years ago, is, become, is becoming their co-GM for a year, and then he'll take over. They're just very well run, and they've got a great fan base. They're a, they're a lot like L.A., but you know, maybe, you know, maybe they're going to be quietly in on Soto. Who knows? But they've also – most teams have a uh, – except for maybe the, the Yankees and the Mets, most of them have a budget that they're going to try to adhere to to some extent. And when you're talking about Juan Soto, if you're signing him before Thanksgiving, you are you are just saying, tell me how much, and I'll put it on the line. I think he signs in the winter meetings. What do you think? Um, perhaps, but it will have to be a deal that Scott is really satisfied with, that this is going to be the best it is. Um, you know, maybe this precludes, you know, you ask about Sasaki. This may preclude the Dodgers going after Soto unless the market crashes and he needs, he'll, he'll take a short term deal like, like Snell did last year. But, you know, I don't foresee that when you have the two New York teams involved and Mr. Cohen, who is really hungry to win and hasn't, you know, that, that may meet whatever, whatever Scott and, and Monsoto want. Yeah, I've said on this show, I think it ends up over 700 because I just think that it gets a little crazy and Cone just goes, ah, screw it. it. Yeah. You know, it the guy's worth easily. Yeah. 21 billion. What's what's 800 million to, to him over the course of 14 years? Yeah. You, uh, you know, you know it, is, it is a different dynamic than, than Shohei because part of the Dodgers thinking on Otani was that they're going to tap into the Asian market. Huge. They've already, you know, we signed players from Japan and Korea and Taiwan uh, when I was there. And long before I was there, you know, they, they did the same thing. Chan Ho Park from Korea, Hideo Nomo, um, you know, and, and many more, you know. So, you know, they knew that they could recoup a lot of this, the finances mm -hmm. of it, especially the way Shohei 
structured it with the, all the deferral. Yeah. And, and, and this is what they do for a living. I mean, they make money. That's what they do. And so they, they will pay for Shohei in a heartbeat. Now, does Soto have the same type of marketability no. outside the United States? I don't think he does. I don't know if people – people will pay to go see Otani play. There's no doubt. He is what you would call in the old days a drawing card. You look at, at the Babe Ruth plaque at Cooperstown, it says baseball's greatest drawing card. You know, I don't know yeah. how many other players. I mean, if we can go around the room here or we could ask fans, you know, who else would you pay to see play? Would you pay to see Juan Soto pay play? I don't know that you would. Maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. But you'll definitely pay for Otani. Right. And I think the, the, the genius behind Otani and the Dodgers deal was that Otani – came to them supposedly with the deferral so mm -hmm. that they could sign other players. The Dodgers reportedly made $120 million last year off of Shohei Otani. So that basically allows them to go get a Juan Soto and it does, and they don't lose money because. Well, yeah. Yes and no. But at some point in time, you know, it's, you know, do you want to be paying a luxury tax that is, you know, off the charts over and over again. And there's other ramifications than just a dollar figure. Plus you do have to build a team. Now, you know, Juan Soto has been the best player on pretty much every team he's played on, you know, and even, even better than, you know, Aaron judge in some people's mind, not as much power, but a better hitter, perhaps tough to say, but at least, at least to equal to it, you know, you come to LA, you're one of, one of a handful of guys that are in that elite category. The one thing that I think appeals to the Dodgers without knowing anything on the inside is the market crashes and it's going to be a short-term deal. Okay. Mm. Because when Shohei doesn't pitch, he's going to DH. At some point in time, if you're talking about six, seven, eight, 10, 12, 14 years for Juan Soto, some of that's going to be as a DH. Maybe half of it, if it's 14, maybe a little bit more than half. Who knows? But, you know, you, you, you only got room for one DH. So I think in the Dodgers' mind, look, we'll do this short term because he can still play the outfield for us short term. And we'll overpay short term and give him a chance to go back out there. 26 years old, you go back there at 29 years old, you're still a young. Right, the opt-out. Could, I could see a deal where they go 400 uh, eight years, 400 with an opt out after year three, something like that. Yeah. You'd, you'd have to, you'd have to structure it to really almost encourage the opt out. Right. If you wanted him, if you really wanted him for three years, there's a way to do that where you pay, you pay more hundred million. In the first three. <laughs> hundred million? Pay, well, you pay more in the first three than you do the last three. Yeah. 